Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds as I'm seeing quite a few people uh, in the process of logging on and we'll get started. All right, it's been a minute, so I'll go ahead and get started. Again, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Momadou, and I'm the director of uh, Hobo Product Management. So I have the privilege of leading the Hobo Product Management team. So before we get started, um, a couple webinar logistics. Uh, first, I'm estimating that I'll need no more than 45 minutes to go through the material uh, I have prepared, leaving us hopefully 15 minutes or so. Uh, to answer questions. So please at any time use the question box to enter your questions. A little bit uh, a bit more about me again. My name is Mamadou. Uh, I've been with Onset uh, for now officially 11 years. Uh, first eight years I was a member, well more like seven, actually eight. Yes, the first eight years I was actually a member of the hardware design team and held uh, various uh, product development role. Um, but for the last uh, uh, three years, I've been working with our customers and users to understand their needs and, and turning those into products. My primary focus is on connected products. Uh, for folks familiar with our product line, that's the RX stations and Hobonet uh, sensors uh, serving environmental research and agricultural application. So for anyone who's new to Onset, Onset Computer Corporation is a leading provider of sensors and data logging solutions. And I would say historically, we are known as a provider of accurate, reliable, you know, affordable data logging and monitoring uh, solution. And our products are used in, uh, in uh, various applications. Uh, now for now a little bit now for about 43 years now, uh, we've built a strong market presence and we are known by, by our brand name, Hobo. Uh, that's our go-to brand name. And our products and solution, fundamentally what they do, they measure and record critical environmental information such, such as humidity, temperature, water level, uh, and water quality for, um, for generally for decision-making and to support um, uh, systems. So the agenda I have prepared today is to first, you know, talk through the challenges uh, that our customers have shared with us uh, with respect to agriculture, and then do an introduction to Hobonet for folks that may be too familiar with Hobonet. And and I'm and also I'll open up Hobolink, uh, which is our cloud platform, to do a quick demo so that uh, as we go through the second part of the webinar. Uh, discussing the benefits and some of the application examples, so at least people can can relate uh, to to the product. So jumping in, uh, challenges in agriculture. So talking to our customers, you know, some of the things we hear is generally around the impact of uh, of climate. Um, I was just recently looking at a survey, and I was. Uh, you know, at this point, I guess I shouldn't be surprised anymore, right? Where there was a staggering 75% of North American farmers ranking weather and climate challenges at the top of their concern. Uh, and the reality for a lot of these growers, which uh, over half, if not 80% of them are family owned farm, right? Is that these unpredictable weather pattern translate directly into financial distress uh, and losses for their crops. Um, and then you start adding into that, you know, some of the stringent environmental regulations, especially in some regions, uh, the heightened customer expectation for sustainable practices and the ever uh, present uh, cost and availability of labor. And I think all those uh, and you layer in the, the aging work, workforce in certain region, uh, really uh, all those forces you know, I, I think of them as almost like a tornado, right? Uh, it's uh, just a lot of challenges that growers, uh, researchers, and farmers have to have to work through. Uh, but you know, some tools that a lot of folks uh, 
leverage out there. There's a while there are free online resources uh, that offer a surface level understanding of what's happening in the field. Uh, I think just based on our research and 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 talking to expert, I think you know it is pretty much agreed upon that some level of on-site monitoring devices that provide more of an in-depth and localized snapshot of weather impacts really does enable a more agile and more informed operation for growers. And I would say that's where we come in with our products trying to help um, uh, growers overcome some of those challenges. So to that end, I would like I'll introduce uh, folks to to Hobonet, especially new, newer newer users or people that are not very familiar with Hobo. So Hobonet in general is based on our field monitoring system. Uh, so by field by our field monitoring system, what do I mean by that? It is just a set of hardware and software tools and components. And sometimes, you know, it has connectivity, like the products I'll be talking about today, which are cellular-based products. And sometimes they, they, they're not, it's just standalone devices where you need to have a physical access or proximity to it with Bluetooth to talk to them. But generally they enable users to monitor the environment condition in a, uh, in a field, for example. Um, as a grower or researcher, uh, what it means to you is really the ability to monitor microclimates uh, in the grand scheme of things and to have an understanding of the conditions of weather changes from point to point. Uh, we do believe, again, going back into having on-site uh, monitoring to help you, uh, we do believe that you know it is it provides you really the ability to know what your crops in general are experiencing on your farm based on direct measurement rather than basing it off weather data from maybe an airport or some other location that can be 20 to 30 miles away uh, as microclimate does affect crops quite a bit. So Hobonet, what's Hobonet? So uh, it's our um, I guess product name for our uh, wireless mesh network product. So it's a sub gigahertz wireless mesh network operating uh, within the sub gigahertz uh, frequency band. It's a mesh topology. Uh, it enables devices to not only connect directly to a central point. In our case, that's the main station that acts like a hub, but they also communicate uh, amongst them. So by leveraging uh, those multiple nodes are, as a potential relay point, data, the data can travel through the network via several hops. In the case of our products, it's five hops. And that really enhances coverage and the reliability. And it is really ideal uh, for application that require a wide area of coverage, uh, such as agriculture. A little bit more about mesh network in general. I mean, I would say it is it is built in, there, there are four, four pillars, I would say. Uh, one of them is just around range and reliability. Uh, so really uh, with Hobonet, it is a self-forming, self-healing network meaning the moment you add these sensors to your system, they start to communicate to, with each other uh, without you having to do additional configuration. In our case, once you have a system, I always equate it to pairing you know, your Bluetooth devices. So you put one in search mode, you press a button uh, on the Hubonet sensors and it joins the system. Uh, it may take a couple of minutes for the first device to join the system, but after that, they all join the system rather rapidly. Uh, the, the sub gigahertz spectrum, again, what it does, it gives you greater special um, uh, coverage, but also, you know, not all, not all, um, you know, not all deployment are the same, but it generally, it allows you to penetrate uh, through obstacle and longer and get longer range compared to higher frequency network, for example, like 2.4 uh, gigahertz, for example. Uh, and the hopping mechanism, again, is what gives you that scale uh, and that range. And you can have up to 50 sensors per sensor, uh, per, per system in our, in our situation. And again, there is a simplicity. We really try to do all the hard work in the background and making it uh, as easy as we can for our users. All they have to do, again, to add one of these devices to your system is to push a button and it joins the system. Okay. I think we've touched on some of these key features already. I already touched on them. I would say, you know, some so one thing to keep in mind that you know the max um, 
the max capability is around 50 sensors, but keeping in mind, let's say a sensor like temperature and relative humidity that actually has uh, two, two channels. So depending on the number of channels uh, a sensor has, it could end up being less than 50 sensors per se, but the max number of channels is actually 336. I know it's a bit of an odd number, but probably just has to do with the bits that were available on the firmware side. So what we offer today from a sensor capability, uh, you know, we have the weather parameters, right? From temperature, temperature relative humidity, solar radiation, power, wind, wind speed, and, and rain. Um, and then we also have a leaf wetness sensor, which is actually pretty important if you're doing anything around pest management. And beside those weather parameters, then we have our soil moisture sensors, uh, where we have uh, uh, some of sensors that we use from meter group, and we also have a multi-depth uh, grow point sensor. And the next layer after that are our water products, where in a case of a farm, if you have a well, where you can actually measure your water level in your well. Uh, and also we have this pulse uh, uh, node, which can allow you, if you have a meter with a pulse output, you can actually know how much water you're using. So I'll, I'll give you examples of, uh, once we transition to the application section where some of these products make sense to use and how we see our users um, take great advantage of it. All right, so I wanna just do a quick show and tell, won't be very in depth, but I thought uh, opening up Hobolink, our cloud web portal uh, for managing devices and data, just to show you how it looks, especially if you're not familiar with it, could be helpful. So please bear with me. It is always a risky proposition to do a demo live, but I'll give it a shot. So this is an example of if you have a wireless uh, system deployed, what it would look like. This is actually a live system. Uh, probably as I'm talking through it, you'll see the screen refresh. Uh, but this is a local farm, as you can see, uh, at, the, at the center, you have your field monitoring system, your weather station, where again, you have a lot of those weather parameters and it, anything from a rain gauge, leaf wetness, wind speed and direction, temperature, relative humidity. Then in this case, in this farm, right, they have greenhouses. And in these greenhouses, they care about the temperature inside the greenhouses. So they have temperature sensors inside those greenhouses. They have, and they have different fills. Uh, this one is a blueberry patch. Uh, this one is some yellow black fill. I frankly don't know what it means, but I, again, it just gives you the a view of what, and this is like a pretty small scale uh, farm actually, but it just gives you again, being able to use uh, one system and having that spatial uh, uh, coverage uh, and that parameter diversity to be able to measure what matters to you. So in the case of the greenhouses, you care about temperature, but maybe in the case of you know some of the outdoor work that they're doing, they care about the soil moisture, for instance. Uh, let me I'll I'll step I'll step from it from uh, top to bottom uh, just to show you some of the features. So in this case, what you're looking at is uh, our dashboard. So in these greenhouses, they have temperature sensors and they have a gauge. Uh, and actually, I'll show you how they have it set up. So for these for these gauges, for example, the way they have it formatted is that uh, so long the temperature, and keeping in mind this is in Fahrenheit, uh, if so long the temperature is between 40 and 80 degrees, it reports as green. If it's below 40, it's too cold for their plants, turns blue, and then anything over 80 turns red. So kind of, you know, as they start they, their day, this is a good place to get started from to quickly get a sense of, of uh, 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 what does the environment look like for the plants? And for the uh, wind sensors, they have one at the station, they have one near the pond, it gives them a sense of wind direction, which could be uh, good information, let's say, if you are making a decision to, to spray, uh, to apply pesticide or things like that, which it has uh, some impacts. Um, this is just a time series view. So for example, they've taken all their temperature sensors, I think it's probably about this got C set, uh, seven of them, put them in a single graph. 
uh, the soil moisture sensors, they put them in a single graph, also gives them a sense of uh, irrigation decision, and I'll touch on that. But this is just to give you a quick sense of the product and what it would look like. Uh, go to the device view. Uh, stepping through it, so on the device view, when you come in, so what you see, this just gives you a quick view uh, of the latest condition, uh, the last time it logged. So in this case, this was as of five minutes ago uh, at uh, 2 10 p.m. So these were the value that they were getting. And it also gives you some health information. So for example, this, um, uh, this uh, node uh, may be in a shaded area. Uh, that's a possibility. So if I was the owner of this system, I would actually go and verify this node and see if I need to either change the direction uh, of that sensor or of the of the receiver with the solar panel so that it can have enough sunlight to recharge. But as you'll see, the majority of the orders are pretty full. Uh, you have wind speed and direction and you have this multi-depth uh, sensor that gives you soil moisture at three levels and about six temperature uh, values. Uh, I think I already touched on the map. Maybe I'll just show you, you know, what it would look like if you're configuring it. Uh, the key things you want to configure is how often do you want that data to be pushed to the cloud? So in this case, they have it, uh, the system pushing the data to the cloud every hour. That said, they're actually logging the, the information every five minutes. So they're sampling logging at a five minute interval, queues up that data, and every hour it pushes that, 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 that data to them. And a lot of the reason around that generally is just uh, to, uh, uh, because that uh, pushing the data to the cloud actually does consume quite a bit of uh, a battery capacity. And that's one way um, uh, to, 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 to manage battery life. Um, and then beside the logging, then you can also set your alarms. So in this case, in the greenhouses, which seems to be what matters most to them at this time of the year, they just have it notifying them as soon as it gets below 40 degrees. Um, so I don't want to just share too much of their personal information. So essentially, if you go here into the setup, it will allow you to enter an email or a phone number. And also you can tell, let, uh, you know, set it up if, if, if it's below 40 uh, degree Fahrenheit for more than five minutes, I want you to send me a text message. And even though a minute ago I was saying it pushes that data to the cloud every hour, but the moment you hit an alarm or a, a threshold, actually it's automatically going to trigger a text message. So that decision to send you a text message or, or an email is made at the station, it's made locally, not, on, not in the cloud. So it doesn't need to wait that hour to have that information available to let you know, so you automatically know, so you can act and, and make a decision. And maybe the final thing I'll touch on is around the data. So you can do quick data exports. Uh, you can export all that data uh, via Excel. Or actually, if every single day when you start your day, you just want to get a sense of what that information was for the previous day, you can actually schedule a delivery. It can be from anywhere from an hour to days. Uh, and if you have maybe a FTP or SFTP uh, site or a folder, you can actually point it there. So a lot of people, what they do, they set this up such that before they start their, their day, uh, that uh, you know the file is delivered so that they just jump in and can quickly view what the previous day looked like. And we also have these data feeds, and this is a, you know, a streamlined setup uh, to integrate with third party providers. For example, there is this network uh, that's based, uh, that's been put together by Cornell, is for integrated pest management, uh, it's called NUA. So we partnered, they verified and, uh, and, and, and approved our, our, our devices. So for a lot of people in the Northeast, they'll buy, let's say, uh, you know, someone with an apple orchard or something like that. They just buy our system, then we provide this free data feed. So all their data gets pushed into this third party system newer. And essentially what it tells them, it lets them know when they should be applying pesticides and if they are any type of fungi and things like that, so they're aware of it. So from an integrated pest management, it's a neat uh, tool. And we are also, we've also partnered with AgWeatherNet, which is based on the West Coast 
by uh, Washington State University. So we also approve on that network and compatible with their network. So I know it's a quick flyby, but again, especially for users that haven't had, uh, for some of the people on the call uh, that haven't had a chance to use the system, I thought I'd show it. And as luck would have it, you know, the next set of data has come up. This temperature is above 80. As you can see earlier, this was green and now it's turned red. Um, so, awesome. So I'll get off here and go back to the slides. So now I'm going to transition to the benefits uh, of, of Hobonet uh, for farmers and users as we see it. Um, so what benefits you can expect from this wireless uh, sensor network? I think the right field monitoring system in general can help you achieve a few things. One, it will reduce costs associated with irrigation by allowing you to water only based on plant, plant demand rather than the schedule set. And once we, I get into the soil moisture section, I'll speak a bit about that. It does also help you protect uh, crops and workers as well. Uh, from a frost monitoring, you can use that weather data, again, to allow you to, to, to act uh, for certain crops, but it also from the, for the workers, right? Uh, if uh, it is so hot that it, if there is excess heat, right, as well. It is where, you know, some of the real-time alerts let you know that there is a risk uh, of frost or excess heat. And also helping you determine when environmental conditions create high risk of pests and when the peak window effectiveness for pesticide application is. Um, I would say alternative, alternatively too, you know, you can avoid applying pesticide if the condition don't warrant their application. So for example, in high wind situation, you don't wanna, uh, you don't wanna, uh, apply your you don't want to spray uh, because um, it, you know some example what one thing that could happen is actually you can end up uh, either spraying your your neighbor's um, farm or spray the wrong crop with the wrong pesticide um, and also you know another example that I can give is that it helps you record historical environmental and activity data for compliance for example, there are regions where there are strict requirements around water use uh, and, and pesticide application. So really, in an, in, you know, again, this allows you, in the case where, let's say you're measuring water, you can exactly report back what, you, what, you, what you're using. And also, again, if, you, if there are restrictions around the number of spraying you can do, at least also this information allow you to not spray when you don't have to. And also earlier I was touching on um, on uh, labor shortage and availability, and this also is almost like a added, added help, right? Um, you it allows you to monitor your field with less people because all the information you need comes to you, and then you can take take action. So these are just few examples of of benefits uh, that we that uh, the system provides. So I'll transition to something that hopefully would be a little bit more fun about application, sharing some examples, uh, things that you know more likely you may be doing, but hopefully you may see a few different things uh, that that you may be able to to use going forward. So when examining the parameters we we measure and provide for agriculture, I tend to categorize them uh, into three buckets. Again, earlier as I was when I was showing our product, I feel like we provide weather data, right, uh, real-time data from wherever you may be to help you improve crop planning and also make some uh, irrigation-based decision. Then we have the soil management side, and this just comes down to soil moisture and temperature, uh, generally around irrigation, and also we have the water data piece of it uh, around water availability use and also the impact in the environment. Uh, with water runoff. So for the next few slides, I'll share a few applications where growers uh, use our weather parameters. So I'll first focus on weather parameters uh, to protect their crops. And then I'll go, uh, you know, in circle, touch on soil and water. So starting with weather in general, the first example I wanted to give was around uh, frost protection. And that's where we've a lot of, we've seen a lot of success with this product line. Uh, where quite a few users use it. And when it comes to this, you know, crops with early season blooms or late in the year, 
when harvest faces the risk that's when harvest faces the risk of frost um understanding frost and how it occurs to better you know so this will i just want to touch on kind of the dynamics of it so that it can just help you understand a little bit more about frost and how it occurred to better uh, understand the mitigation methods so in typical days you know typical days have air temperature rise the closer you get to the ground and temperature drops as altitude increases so warm air in general is lighter so it rises right and replaces uh, and is replaced with cold air so during the day the sun warms the air near the ground but at night this heat rises so on cloudy nights that energy is reflected back towards the ground that is why that frost risk is low on cloudy nights but on clear nights that energy is lost into space so temps near the surface drop forming a layer of cold air near the ground with warmer and that i mean the short of it is that war that warmer air um uh, gets trapped uh is, is trapping it above and, and on windy night this air is it mixes and the risk of frost is reduced however on still night that's really when you have a major concern uh, when the air is dry the air closest to the ground is coldest and and generally it's just re referred to as this inversion and that's where that air gets trapped below and create the uh, risk of frost so some key uh ways around it from a prevention um uh one of them is these wind machines uh, that are used um and also you do have uh, water irrigation so these met methods exist uh well i'll maybe first touch on the wind machines and the use of irrigation and there again there are uh, common mitigation methods we see in our where our products are used um so one of the things though is that you know all these uh, methods they cost money so while effective while effective uh, running a wind machine or irrigation pump does cost does come at a cost um so in terms of i guess i would say how our products really help you in terms of time and money you have a couple options right uh, because we've talked to a lot of uh, cranberry bog owners where they say like before they used to stay up all at night you know uh, watching a thermometer and hopefully correctly accounting for temperature differences between the thermometer and the different points in the field so when it would get cold then they'll go physically and start the, the irrigation Another option was just to spray at night um, or, or run your wind machine based on weather forecast. So if you say it's tonight the temperature is going to drop below a certain value, you just you know uh, uh, automatically turn on your your machines. But that generally leads to waste, uh, as we all know. Forecasts, you know, isn't that isn't the most reliable, right? Uh, uh, it is generally reliable for nights where there is decent air movement. Uh, on calm nights with clear sky, temperature can vary widely from point to point. From point to point. Um, and for wind machines, you want to also confirm there is in fact inversion, uh, and I'll touch uh, on that um, because if you running them too often can actually be a bit disruptive uh, because they're pretty loud machines. So you know you don't always have happy neighbors as you're running them. So just to give a quick example, you know, these values were accurate as of a couple of years ago, but with the, uh, you know, pricing and changes, I'm not sure how accurate the cost of um, fuel is. But just here to give an example, um, let's say you are a grower using irrigation to protect uh, your berries from frost, right? Uh, with a mix of propane and diesel pump. Uh, we actually had a grower, he estimated he used about 80 gallons of fuel over 10 hour frost night per pump. So at uh, $2.80 per gallon, that comes to about $240 uh, per night or $224. And, 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 and in this case, actually, this was a farmer that has a total of 11 pumps running. It's a pretty large uh, operation. So that comes out to roughly about 2,500 for this farmer, for example. So it is, it is pretty expensive uh but necessary right because uh, all it takes is a uh, uh, you know one frost night can actually uh, be fairly costly and again this is where we think hobonet comes with the alarming uh, rather than uh, uh, really um, 
just scheduling um, uh, for your for your irrigation system to to run at night, strictly based on forecast. Actually, using data to actually trigger it uh, can be a fairly um, cost-effective way to manage. So again, this is just more of a picture. This actually is um, a cranberry bog, uh, not far from us. We are based here on Cape Cod, um, you know, harvest from late September through early November. Uh, you know, in general, cranberry bogs are low lying areas, so they have a risk of low temperature. And for this, for this uh, cranberry bog, actually, so they have temperature sensors placed at different point. Um, Again, this is a pretty like point to point uh, example. Um, so we worked with this grower actually to identify the spot on his farm where temperature are the lowest. In this case, after a year of growing, the grower knew where the frost damages were more likely to occur, which was this location. So that's where he, he put the, the sensor uh, and this uh, grower actually on cold night used to stay up. Uh, and walk around and make a decision if he should, uh, you know, irrigate or not. Uh, now, um, and by irrigation, actually, I, I mean like misting, misting so that to protect the, to protect the, his his crops. But now he just, you know, uh, waits to get a text message on an email before he reacts. And this is an example, actually, uh, uh, an orchard in Michigan. They actually use uh, wind machines. Uh, so one of the key things when you're using wind machines is rather than monitoring the temperature at a single height, uh, maybe at the crop height or canopy, you actually need two temperature points are recommended, one at the canopy height and another one about 30 feet high. And this is important to check for a temperature inversion and confirm that the air above the crops is higher than the air at the crop height. Right, going back to that inversion, because the last thing you want is actually to uh, to trigger these machines when you actually don't even have a, a, your your plants are not at a at a risk of frost. And again, I was talking about the scalability uh, of the system. So now I'll this is a slightly uh, uh, larger system. Uh, this is a farm, a fish hill in uh, in New York. So they wanted to to leverage uh, Hobo Hobonet. So actually what they cared about was actually to use the integrated pest management system from NUA that I was talking about earlier. So again, NUA is a crop and pest model service started by Cornell University uh, in which your, da your, da your data from your weather station is uploaded to their service so that you can get hyper-local crop pest and irrigation forecasts along with advice on how to manage threats. Uh, if you would like information on using NUA, we actually have a link on our website or let us know and we'll send you some information. But after looking at the devices needed to set up a complete weather station, uh, they actually decided to add some of the other capability uh, to monitor for frost, soil, uh, and some of their greenhouses, similar to the, to the example I showed you earlier. And also they keep an eye on their cold storage units, which is again, because of the sub gigahertz uh, frequency range, uh, you could actually, if you have an operation near your farm, smaller scale, uh, you could literally have a, one of these sensors inside your uh, storage unit uh, and they'll still be part of the single system. So in this case, how they, system, uh, how they set up their system, uh, again, you'll see here in the image, uh, their setup, they have a cluster of sensors on their greenhouses and cold storage. Uh, here at the bottom, but then you know they had a couple temperature points set up at two different crop locations to monitor frost risk for each of those different crop uh, crop type. Uh, another example I'll give is again as I was mentioning earlier about uh, pest management in uh, uh, in general, but as far as you know the impact again of uh, of uh, of that temperature inversion, right? Um, and 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 how you should use that as well. It does impact the decisions you make around uh, your pest management. So the gist of it again is that the right sensors can also help you ensure that spraying is done in the right conditions to avoid drift, which leads to waste or uh, affecting undesired area. So in this instance, let's say you are spraying 
uh, when it's windy and maybe it was meant for these crops or vice versa what and what ends up happening there could be unintended consequences where you actually uh, end up spraying the wrong plant um, so um, so as, as you you know as I'm sure a lot of you are aware pesticides are created for very targeted application and will often damage crops not bred to withstand their effect uh, and there are two ways in which uh, drift can occur um, uh, but you know again i won't bore you too much with those details but i think the the gist of it is you want to spray only during low wind speeds uh, and that's generally three to eight uh, miles per hour range that's what's recommended uh, but i would say you know when the wind are below three uh, miles per hour that could actually that may indicate uh, temperature inversion uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well yeah i think i'll skip through this we we, we talked about it, but just here visually you can see just get a sense of temperature inversion when it occurs and what it looks like uh, I know I, you know, through the demo, I already showed this. So this was just to give you an example of a greenhouse, how you can leverage the temperature sensors. And again, these are the, the levels. And this is, um, you know, uh, you, you get to select uh, those thresholds, uh, well, what's important to you. But again, the gist of it is it gives you the flexibility. Here, I'll give you an example of a cold storage in a dairy farm. This is actually a farm that's about 15 minutes from where I live. I'm based in Rhode Island, and this is a farm that's in Rhode Island. Uh, so I tend to go there often, you know, to grab some sweets. But in this farm, they actually have, you know, their cows and, and the likes are here. This is their, their milking uh, operation. Uh, and I know it's hard to see, but you'll even see like a pipe running from this building to this building where the milk goes through and they have an operation. So essentially what they do, they actually use Hobonet uh, to monitor uh, their cold storage and their freezers and their coolers. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I went there once and the gentleman was sharing with me that a, there was a year where before they had Hobonet, where I think their HVAC, HVAC system went down at night and when he went came to work in the morning he'd had you know uh, a pretty pretty massive loss uh, he'd share even the number the kind of how it related to from a financial standpoint but i but i honestly don't remember but again a pretty effective way to to protect uh, uh, to protect your investment as well Uh, again, another application example where weather data is being used in agriculture setting that I thought would be neat to, to share. So this is uh, around agrivoltaics. I'm sure quite a few folks may be familiar with it. But again, this is this innovative approach uh, that uh, not only promises increased land and productivity to dual use solar, but also align in general to, to our mission uh, here at Onset with Hobo products. Uh, again, which is aimed at empowering researchers, professional growers uh, with the precise, precise data they need to make some informed decision. So in this case, this is a study. This is the courtesy of uh, Sam Corcoran. Uh, she's based at uh, UMass Amherst. So she's doing some study around uh, dual land use. Uh, again, it's a farming approach where you have both agriculture and solar energy production. So you'll see you'll have your PV panels. Uh, above crops or pasture, uh, allowing you for that dual use. Uh, I won't go too in depth uh, on this on this uh, on this subject. Uh, she actually did a thought leader webinar with us, so we actually have a video recording uh, available on our website. Uh, it is a pretty intriguing uh, work that she's doing and research. So I would um, really nudge you to uh, check check it out on our website. But the general aims about uh, agrivoltaics is around just land efficiency reducing competition for land use. So for example, here in the Northeast, land is very limited. So even if you wanna have a solar farm, it is really hard to find uh, an area where you can do it, depending on where you live. Uh, and really this dual use by being able to integrate um, uh, agriculture uh, and solar energy production is, is a win-win situation in a lot of areas. So a lot of the work that Sam is doing right now is around again using uh, our weather data 
to characterize the climate uh, in these arrays, right? And then comparing it. So essentially, she's doing, a, a, you know, for example, where you see some of our station here. So she came up with her own setup. Uh, made sure that these sensors were at the at crop height. Uh, in this case, it's about two and a half feet. Uh, and she has some of these deployed uh, within the solar panels uh, and others deployed outside of the solar panels. So she has a controlled area and some of the other products are in the array. And some of the things she is looking at, you know, uh, is, is the array cooler on average, how much less light? Uh, does the array have during different point in the growing season, for example, May versus August, and just doing some characterization work and doing a lot of statistical data analysis uh, to help predict, uh, you know, what crop what crops will or won't do well in these systems. Uh, and and uh, we are pretty excited that our products are actually part of this uh, uh, research. And this system is, I think, something like 280 sensors. Uh, she is measuring photosynthetically active radiation, uh, power, ambient temp, humidity, leaf wetness, rainfall. I think she's collecting north of 80,000 data points per day. Um, um, and, uh, and yeah, and she estimates that by the end of this experiment, she'll probably have about 80 million data points uh, to, to do some statistical analysis and come up with recommendation. But again, pretty versatile product, uh, depending on your application and your need. Just wanted to share a few examples on how you can leverage our weather data uh, to make some of, uh, to make informed decision. Uh, I'll speed up here a bit uh, on time, looking at time here. Uh, so now I'll transition quickly to our soil man management. Again, it, it, uh, the main use we see uh, from our users is really using soil, uh, soil moisture. Uh, to make irrigation decisions. Um, now that said, you know how growers go about those decisions is influenced by a lot, several factors, right? The soil type, the crop type, uh, you know, uh, regulations and guidelines depending on on the region you live. So feel feel uh, uh, it's not quite black and white. It's not a binary uh, decision. But um, but I, I do think, though, it is a simple yet effective irrigation tool. Uh, so in general, soil moisture sensors can help you determine when your crop need water uh, and improve irrigation planning by looking at the moisture level, uh, the moisture level changes. Um, so I think I showed it. Uh, this is a snapshot from from uh, our cloud uh, software. Uh, so just this is just a time series uh, reading. So you can be, they, it can be viewed for planning and estimating uh, when you'll next uh, have to water crops. Um, and tying it back to uh, the pest management side of it, perhaps you want to spray uh, and need to verify you can hold off on watering for long enough to not dilute uh, the spray application, right? So that also can play a role uh, into deciding when you wanna apply your, 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 your pesticide. And those soil moisture threshold, similar to what I was showing on the temperature, same thing for the soil moisture threshold. Uh, if you want to be above 20%, you can set a threshold so that once it hits that 20% uh, threshold, uh, you get an alarm notification so that you can uh, activate your, your, your irrigation. So I wanted just to give like a couple example. Again, this color coding, it just helps, you know, for ease of visualization. Uh, you know, anything in the blue area means you're kind of overwatering a little bit. Uh, and, and in the red area, you're at risk of wilting. But depending on the trees that you have, actually, this is where this multi-depth uh, sensor comes in play. Because, for example, here, you know, the blue uh, line is on, on uh, the blue and black are like at the shallow uh, uh, area. Um, and, and as you can see here, the yellow green is around the roots. So it's deeper. So it's around the 26 to 38 uh, inches. You'll see there's not like a lot of activity. It is actually, even though watering is happening, which you can tell by looking at the shallow end, you know, there's some watering happening. But the roots in general, 
you know which really what's most critical you know uh, where you you know where the the plant are pulling water from uh, you can see i mean there's you can see that this uh, uh, looking at the scale and it seems to me they're watering every day especially here uh, but clearly looking at the at from the 26 inches to 38 inches uh, at the root i mean you can see it was still pretty stable i mean you still had about uh, uh, about five percent of margin to go so in my you no know, non-expert <laughs> opinion i would say i would make a recommendation for them to water every other day but again these thresholds would depend on the type of soil and also the plants uh, the plants as well that you have so this is just an example of, of a young tree uh, uh give you an example of a more mature tree uh so this is an example of olives uh as you can see again same color coding uh black and i'm calling it blue uh, you know maybe it's actually purple i don't know i only know as uh, my co-workers know i only know very few colors uh, so um i guess i'll call it blue and stick to blue but those are the shallow end again but again but what matters most is again at the deep roots so as you can see here, these are your deeper roots. I mean, you can see they are pretty stable. So for uh, for this uh, for these olive trees, you know, uh, the farmer has decided that the sweet spot is between 15% and 35%. But as you'll see here, you know, uh, the moisture at the roots was actually uh, dead on in the middle but yet a watering event happened. So it, all it did was just pretty much create waste. You know, I would say that so long this level didn't dip and getting closer to this 15%, I frankly wouldn't necessarily uh, 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 water. I mean, in this case as well, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, there's some waste of water here. So again, just, you know, note, no two setup or scenarios are the same. Again, would just depend on your application uh, and and what you're trying to this type of decisions you're trying to make. And again, this is kind of the the wiggle room I'm talking about. I would say it has about a 10% wiggle room. And I want to keep my promise at a minimum. Give few minutes for question. Uh, apologies here, uh, but I'll touch last on water management, uh, and I'll probably just give one example. Uh, so for example, if you live in a state like California, uh, there's a lot of regulation around water use. Um, as uh, most of you are likely aware, uh, you know, agriculture uh, uses probably about 70% uh, of, uh, of the fresh water that, that's used here in the US. So one of the key things in some regions is actually to measure uh, from a regulation standpoint, is actually to be able to provide information on your water use and your impact in the aquifer. So quickly here on pump down and refill rate in agriculture, it's generally refers to the process and speed at which water is pumped out of the well. And that's kind of the pump down piece of it. Uh, and the rate at which uh, the water level in the well recovers or refills after the pumping stops. So again, these these rates, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of regulations around it. But that said, it can be overregulated if you don't have proof to show that you know that you are actually not, you know, drastically impacting the aquifer, right? Because the key here is just to avoid over extracting uh, water that could lead to either the well uh, depleting or the aquifer depleting. But that said, you know, in this case, for example, you can see this is when they start the pump down. They pump for about, you know, four hours or so. Uh, looking at the amount of water they're pumping uh, per hour, so it's about 10k, 10k, five. So somewhere between, I don't know, call it 38 and 40k or 40,000 gallons of water. But that said, you know, if let's say for regulator came and was measuring and they just do a single point measurement when this event was happening next thing they'll, they'll say that this this farmer is really collapsing this aquifer but that said what's critical here is to look at you know actually once they start pumping 
I mean, how fast uh, that that uh, the refill is is happening. Um, you know, I mean, I would say within probably 30 minutes to an hour, it's back to 90% to where it was. And maybe after a couple of hours, it is back to the initial level. So in this case, to not deplete this aquifer, what's key is to keep track of this water, of this, I'll call it this, um, this baseline over time. So as you pumping, you know, let's call it over months, year, maybe you start and you are around 39 feet but maybe by year five, your baseline is more 45 feet or even 55 feet. I mean, that should give you a sense that, okay, over time, I'm really uh, starting to, uh, to deplete this aquifer or this well. And it can also help you start planning. But more importantly, I mean, that piece is important, but also again, it all depends on your need. But if uh, from a regulatory compliance and auditing, uh, this, you know, like as, as we like to say, the proof is in the data. This is actually data you can sh uh, you can share to show that uh, that you are compliant. Um, so, uh, yeah. So those are a few examples I wanted to sh to share. Uh, figure I'll take a minute here and look at a couple of the questions um, before I jump in. So some questions are on sharing the recording. Yes, we'll make sure we get you that recording. Um, I need a data logger to measure airflow, temp, relative humidity, inside and at four points simultaneously. I would say what I would recommend is actually this system, Hobonet. So Ali, I'll make sure uh, it's. Uh, I'll make sure we send you information on it. Uh, and by the way, if you go on our website, uh, Onset Comp uh dot com all our pricing products uh, are there uh and actually if you scan if you happen to be sitting with your phone if you scan this qr code it's going to take you directly uh to uh to our website uh to give you a sense of what the system looks like um and yeah, so again, uh, we are a global company for folks that are not very aware. And uh, again, these are the contact information if you need help. And I'll get back to some of the questions here. I have an 18-nth version of the Hobo GP3 multi-depth sensor. Every sensor shows six different values of temperature. So what are those values? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good view. Maybe the best view might be, let me see if I can see all slide. See if there is to help answer this question. So I know this is this is probably not the best view, but uh, what you're looking at there, uh, Sabine, is that, you know, I think it's about every 10 centimeters and some areas is about uh, every 15 centimeters, there's a temperature. Uh, there's a temperature sensor. So these dots in red. So this is the, this is not the 18 inch one. This is the 30, uh, 36 inch one. But you'll see, I think this one has this. Let's see, so this, this has 11 temperature sensor. Uh, so if you actually look at our user manual, it's going to tell you exactly uh, where those temperature sensors are. Uh, but it's about every 10 or 15 centimeters. Uh, here, getting here, a question from Angela around uh, uh, wet bulb temp. Unfortunately, right now we don't have that, but we are hoping to provide that as a uh, as a calculated channel. Uh, so there will be some equation we need to come up with, or a new sensor offering. But that's it's actually on 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 our, on our roadmap. Um, there's definitely some uh, some accepted you know equations out there. Uh, that can be used uh, to using temperature, relative humidity, and I think in wind speed to correlate it to well, wet bulb temp. Um, but that's not something we offer now, but we have every intention of offering it at some point. Can the water level sensor be deployed uh, in moving stream of Fabrizio? Yes, it can. Uh, but definitely, you know, uh, we do have a lot of guidelines, uh, deployment guidelines. Um, unfortunately, I just want to touch on the applications today. I didn't touch on deployment guidelines. It all depends on how, you know, it, it just has to be secured uh, accordingly. Uh, but yes, it can be uh, deployed in moving uh, streams. Where can I find the slide? Omar, um, I know we will send uh, 
a, a video of the recording, but I am not sure if we share the slides. I'm not sure if there's something we can do, but I'll take a note, Omar, and ask our marketing communications team and see if that's something we can make available. Can they communicate if they are not in line of sight? So Fabrizio, yes. Yeah. So from the communication, line of sight is ideal. So essentially what I like to say is like, you want these sensors as high as possible. So those that specs that I shared, that 1500 feet uh, communication range or about 600 meters, that's based on the sensor uh, or the, the transceiver, uh, the, the white part of the, of the device. Actually, let me just see if I can show it. So, so what you wanna do is like this transceiver, generally you just wanna try to have it as high as possible to get a good range. So the antenna is actually placed here. So this range of 600 meters assumes that this transceiver is at a height of 1.8 meters. The higher it gets, the longer the range. Uh, we use this in uh, deployments where it's, there's, uh, there's vegetation and they still perform accordingly. But what I would say is just like no two deployment is the same. Uh, you just have to, 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 to deploy and, and adjust. But uh, one of the important thing to keep in mind from a deployment really what you want to do is leverage this mesh networking uh you know depending on your on your needs and 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 the options that you have i mean yes you can try to expand them serially uh but uh, in general what you want to do is you want to provide some redundant path so that your your uh, your system is as solid and strong as possible uh, you kind of want to avoid having them in line because at that point you have the potential of a single failure point and that can be problematic. So yes, as far as the differences between uh, the sampling uh, and 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 uh, and the logging, so those are two different ones. Uh, so I may have used the wrong term, but we have a, so I think, we refer to it as readout. So that one hour would be when you push that data, but we have you know, another one where the sampling or the logging. So for example, the system that I was showing earlier, that data is being pushed to the cloud every hour, but the sampling was a five minute sampling rate, Sabine. May have, I missed this on the topic. How many temperatures do you recommend per acre? That's a great question, Angela. I don't have an answer right now, but I'll be sure uh, to, 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 to follow up on that. Um, but I would say again, but recommendation definitely would depend on the terrain as well. You know, do you have hills, do you not have hills, you know, just the, what microclimate uh, looks in your area, Angela. But I'll, I'll take this question, at least provide some level of guidance um, um, that I can. I tried to look how these sensors work. So I dipped it in a bucket of water. The data showed 0.5 meters cube per meter cube. How can this be? Um, so Sabine, uh, what sensor is that? Uh, it would be interesting if you specify which sensor because that should be uh, that should be fully saturated. The only thing I can think of uh, as far as why you're getting that reading is maybe I would leave it in that bucket and make sure actually that the latest condition is, you know, to give it time to sample that data and provide it. So I'm just, this is, I, I, I actually don't know since I'm not there, but I'm thinking that that data you're seeing may be the previous condition. So maybe it may have to do between the sampling rate and the logging rate, as you were referring to earlier. Uh, but if that persists, please reach out to us and we'll help you work through that. But yeah, if you dip it in water, it should, I think 0.6 or 0.7 is considered as fully saturated. So you should be seeing something around 0 0.6, 0 0.7 or something higher. Sure, you guys welcome. Well, thank you. We are at time. Couple more questions here, but I'll be sure to answer those. I wanna make, be mindful of your time. Uh, I really um, 
do appreciate you um, choosing to spend this hour with us. Your presence means a lot to me and onset, and I truly appreciate it. So be well and take care. Have a good day.